Well, good afternoon. My name is Trevor Harrison. I'm director of Parkland Institute. Welcome to the closing address for our uh, 17th annual conference of Parkland Institute. I have just a few uh, announcements to make before we'll be uh, turning it over to our uh, featured speaker of the afternoon. Uh, just one very quick announcement here, something is coming up. Uh, Public Interest Alberta is going to be holding a conference in April from 11th to 13th. Uh, Dr. Vandana Shiva is going to be presenting uh, in Calgary on April 10th and in Edmonton on April 11th in conjunction with that, so keep that in mind. Uh, again, in terms of uh, this conference, of course, uh, putting on a conference of this magnitude is not possible without an awful lot of support. So there's a number of people I certainly want to, to thank this uh, today. Thanks to the uh, conference sponsors, the Alberta Federation of Labour, Athabasca University, Bullfrog Power, the Canadian Union of Public Employees, <laughs> Civic Service Union Local 52, the Confederation of Alberta Faculty Associations, the Health Sciences Association of Alberta. <laughs> A few supporters there, I, I can tell. Listen Louder Sound, United Nurses of Alberta. <laughs> Trying to outdo each other now, I can tell. It's, it's competitive. University of Alberta's Faculty of Arts the University of Alberta Graduate Students Association and the Woodsworth Irvine Socialist Fellowship Endowment. Thanks also to the media sponsors for their generous support. Alberta Views Magazine, View Weekly, CJSR Radio Edmonton and CJSW Radio Calgary. A big thanks also to a few small businesses that have really helped us out. Uh, first to uh, Earth's General Store for their freshly roasted uh, fresh ground fair trade coffee, which I know we've all appreciated, I certainly have every morning, and other fair trade products that we served over the weekend. To Bon Ton Bakery for the fabulous pastries. And the upper crust for catering our lunch yesterday. Also, also, a special thank you to Douglas and McIntyre Publishers for their support of the book reading and social that was held last night. Thank you very much. Most important, thanks to many the many volunteers who've made this conference so, uh, so successful. Uh, we couldn't do that without the volunteers every year. We also had uh, over 50 volunteers this year who helped make this conference happen. This includes the conference steering committee, the facilitators and all the volunteers who have helped throughout uh, making this uh, conference work. And again, thanks so much to all of you. Uh, perhaps at this point I could ask all the volunteers, in fact, here to maybe just stand up. Please, please. This is your moment. <laughs> Want to make a special thanks to Ray Weinfeld and Listen Louder Sound for coordinating and taking care of all our audiovisual needs. Mark Coppin for ensuring that we get both audio and red video recordings of the conference for our website. Chelsea Pratchett for spearheading the webcasting of the conference and Rob Butts for all his effort in keeping our conference website operational and online. One of the largest thank yous, as always, I have to give out to our incredibly uh, dedicated, wonderful staff. Uh, I can never say too much about how fabulous these people are. Uh, Ilana Boutwell, uh, if Ilana is here, our conference coordinator this year has done just a spectacular job. Charlene Oliver, yes, is Ilana here? Charlene Oliver, our Outreach and Communications Coordinator. I know that Charlene, please, yes, thank her very much. We won't see her here because she's out there already still doing incredible stuff out there. Otana Rakshani, our ad, uh, Administration Coordinator. Thank you. And finally, although he never puts his name down on these notes, but I always have to thank you. Ricardo Acuna at the back here. Thanks so much, Ricardo.
please remember that Parkland receives no corporate, foundation, or government funding. Events like this are only possible because of the generous donations we receive from individuals like you and the organizations, organizations that you belong to. If you haven't filled out a pledge form yet, I'm hoping that you will uh, choose to do so. And also, please pick some up, give them to your friends. Your support, public support, is what really makes Parkland go. Thank you. Uh, you will see here that you have name tags, of course. Please leave these in a box outside the door because we will use them. Every little penny saved is a penny we can use somewhere else. Uh, one last reminder, please uh, take a few minutes also. You see that there's an evaluation package as part of the uh, material you got. Please fill those out. One of the things that we do shortly after the conference every year is we sit down, we go over that material, we talk about what happened, what worked, what maybe didn't work so well, what we can do to improve next year. So uh, please fill those out for us. Okay, well, I want to turn to our uh, featured speaker of the day. Um, this year's Parkland conference has been titled Facts, Fictions, and the Politics of Truth. And I have to say, as I said Friday night, uh, that this has not been an easy subject to tackle, for sure. Uh, and in keeping with the football imagery that I just used there, however, I think we could safely say that we kind of scored a touchdown this, this over the last few days here. Um, how we obtain and understand information has changed enormously in only a few years. Many of us, certainly I, uh, will uh, remember the early days of television, if not radio, a time of a few stations and when the screen was black and white. Many of us, too, will remember computers that filled entire rooms and handheld phones the size and nearly the weight of barbells. Technology has changed all that, and in some ways for the better, in some ways for the worse. Our closing speaker this year will take us into the world of these technological changes and some of the legal and other complexities surrounding information in the 21st century. Now, it's kind of commonplace at many of these things to say my, uh, the, you know, the next speaker uh, needs no introduction, uh, although I'm going to give one. But in some sense, uh, you may have, in fact, felt that you've been introduced to Dr. Michael Geist over the last while, because I know myself, anytime I turn on the radio for the last number of weeks, I hear Michael being interviewed on any number of subjects. Uh, most recently, as you'll know, uh, in terms of the proposed uh, cyberbullying law. Uh, so uh, we're incredibly pleased to have someone who is so contemporaneously involved in many of these issues. Dr. Geist is a law professor at the University of Ottawa, where he holds the Canada Research Chair in Internet and E-Commerce Law. Dr. Geist is a columnist, editor and blogger on technology and law issues, he has received numerous awards for his work and is noted as one of the 25 most influential lawyers in Canada. Geist has been named one of Canada's top 40 under 40 and recognized as one of the world's 50 most influential people on the topic of intellectual property. His presentation this afternoon is The Digital Rights Movement in Canada, Freedom of Speech and Privacy. And I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Geist to speak this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks so much. Great. Everyone can hear me okay? Yeah, that's good. Great. Well, so thanks so much. And thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, sound, I'm amazed, frankly, that there are this number of people out on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. And I'm really grateful. Uh, that you stuck around to hear what I have to say and then hopefully afterwards we can engage in a bit of discussion if you like. So I titled, you heard one title, I titled this one Inside the Fight for Digital Rights in Canada and as, as you heard, uh, just as I was sort of finalizing what I intended to talk about, the government gave me yet another thing to talk about. <laughs> and so uh, at a conference devoted to things about fact and fiction and, and rhetoric that is often used, I think you'd be hard pressed to come up with a better example uh, of the kind of rhetoric that has often been used, particularly around legislation that will have an impact, certainly on kids, but on everybody, particularly from a digital perspective, than what is often referred to as lawful access. Lawful access, and even the term lawful access is itself uh, a nice rhetorical play. 
uh, talking about what is lawful to be accessed. I had an editor at the Toronto Star when I used to uh, when, when I would write about lawful access that actually refused to allow me to use that term. Um, he said you can use awful access if you want, um, but you can't use lawful access. Uh, and the reason for that is that what we were often talking about, we found, was really surveillance related issues and incursions on privacy, uh, as opposed to striking a real balance around lawful access. Now sure enough, on Thursday, despite the fact that uh, the Canadian public had been told that lawful access was dead and buried for the foreseeable future, back came Bill C-13 legislation, and there we see our uh, Justice Minister Peter McKay um, with the, protect with the pe Protecting Our Children slogan, um, talking about legislation that was supposedly about cyberbullying. And in fairness, there are several pages in the legislation out of a 70-page bill uh, that does indeed deal with cyberbullying, an issue that I think uh, most would agree is a real issue. And if there are things that we can do to lessen uh, the likelihood of cyberbullying occurring, I think most would say that that's a good thing to do. But yet the actual name of the legislation, despite the fact that what the government put forward was almost exclusively backgrounders on the cyberbullying side of the story, was actually protecting Canadians from Online Crime Act, and indeed virtually all the legislation other than the first few pages on cyberbullying is a return of many, though not all, of the lawful access provisions that we saw not long ago. Now it is worth noting that it didn't take long for many people to figure this out. In fact, the government, as I say, introduced this uh, on Thursday, and you always get a good, you can always have a, a good clue as to whether or not the government thinks this is a good news story, bad news story, and whether or not they're willing to take differing views on legislation based on the time of day at which it gets introduced. Because there are days in the week where bills will be introduced in the morning, uh, which actually provides for a full day of, of media to talk to any number of different perspectives and put that into their coverage. Uh, or sometimes bills are introduced late in the afternoon after question period, uh, at which time there really isn't time for anything other than the cameras to have the minister introducing the bill and whoever else is brought along um, because the six o'clock news is coming. This was a late afternoon uh, introduction, even though one would think cyberbullying would be the sort of thing the government would want to promote. And I suspect the reason for that is once people started to take a look at the legislation itself, they found that it went well beyond that. Well, by Friday and into this weekend, people have begun to recognize that that's exactly the case. Uh, it is not, and we'll talk more about the lawful access in its prior iterations in a few minutes. It is not the same bill that was introduced and ultimately defeated, uh, but there are certainly many provisions in there, and we can get in, if you like, into some of the specifics that I think are uh, somewhat troubling. Hard to believe anybody would say they're missing Victes, I have to say. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the legislation using the rhetoric, uh, using the claims of cyberbullying in this instance to mask legislation uh, that was looking to do much else. Now, I don't know the future of this bill, Bill C-13. By Friday, actually, I talked to uh, one opposition critic member of parliament who uh, indicated that their party was thinking of moving toward, moving, pushing for the government to actually separate the two bills um, so that there would be one bill to deal specifically with cyberbullying and the expectation that there would be all party support for it uh, and take the lawful access provisions and deal with those on their own. Um, I suspect the government will be reticent to do that, um, in which case we'll get the entire package yet again and much like we had with uh, Vic Tays in the last bill, those that argue against elements of this bill will somehow, I suppose, be uh, labeled uh, proponents of cyberbullying or something like that. Um, we'll have to see. But if there is a fight over this, it will be one of, I think, many in what has, I think, been a bit of an underplayed story in Canada. Now, if you talk about the emergence of using the online environment to fight for digital rights, the kind of activism that we have seen emerge over the last number of years. Certainly if you talk about it outside of Canada and you ask people for illustrations or examples of successful campaigns, um, the ones in Canada probably don't come to mind for people certainly outside of this country. Um, if you ask people in the United States, what they're most likely to think of is this page here which was the fight against SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act in the United States from a couple of years ago, 
uh, copyright legislation that would have had a significant and dramatic impact on the internet in the United States, and actually the impact would have been felt not just in the United States, but by internet users around the world. The internet community rallied against it through a whole number of uh, different campaigns, starting with the Free Bieber campaign, some of you may recall this, uh, that supposed that if this legislation were to be passed, uh, Justin Bieber could find himself in jail. It was never really clear whether or not that was for or against the legislation, uh, I have to admit. But it at a minimum succeeded in getting a lot of people engaged on the issue and at least aware of uh, this legislation. But what really turned the tide was this page here. This was the Wikipedia page that appeared one January morning. My son came down actually and had, was looking something up. I assume he was trying to get his homework done really late. Uh, that, that, that morning and was saying, you know, Dad, I was looking and this is the, the pay, Wikipedia isn't up. Instead, it, instead, I'm seeing this page here about imagining a world without free knowledge. Um, he was one of about 160 million people, or at least 160 million times that this page was accessed over a 24-hour period, which tells us a lot of just how dependent we've become upon a crowdsourced uh, source of knowledge like Wikipedia that many said could never really exist or be reliable. Uh, and yet when, when Wikipedia took the steps to say, we're going to black out because we're fearful about what this legislation might mean for our ability to operate, many began to take notice. And certainly from a political perspective, they did. In fact, by the end of the week, within just days, this is a page from ProPublica in the United States. It's a little bit hard to see, but uh, on January the 18th, there were 80 declared supporters within the US Congress for uh, SOPA PIPA. There were 31 opponents. A day later, so this is the day after the Wikipedia blackout, the number of supporters had begun to shrink. The number of people who were now openly opposed to the legislation had tripled. And by the end of the week, a piece of legislation that was the number one lobbying priority of what many would regard as the number one lobby group in the United States. Um, involving uh, the pharmaceutical industry, big pharma, uh, Hollywood, as well as the recording industry, had found that piece of legislation dead. Um, you don't kill legislative initiatives from groups as powerful as that, and yet that's exactly what happened uh, in the SOPA context. And so certainly in the United States, that's what would come to mind. In Europe, they probably think about what happened with respect to ACTA the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, of which we were a part and which came out again, played out immediately actually after SOPA. ACTA was a battle and who could be against an anti-counterfeiting trade agreement except for an agreement that would have significant implications for individual privacy, for the deliverer, delivery of generic pharmaceuticals, and for a range of other kinds of issues. The agreement gets signed in 2001. Uh, that's Ed Fast, our international trade minister, signing on behalf of Canada. You can see many of the other flags up there of people that, of countries that did sign, many from Asia and the United States. There are no European flags there, though, and that was not because they hadn't participated in the discussions and negotiations they had. They actually had agreed to it. But largely for administrative reasons, the EU, with the so many member states, wasn't in a position to sign yet. As it happened, most, though not all, there were five countries that didn't sign, but most of the countries signed about a week after the Wikipedia blackout that I showed you a moment ago. What led, what, what, what resulted in the immediate aftermath of that was nothing short of amazing on something that is essentially a copyright treaty. As thousands and then tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets in countries across Europe to protest against the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, Politicians, this is from uh, the Polish parliament with opposition MPs donning Guy Fawkes masks uh, as a sign of protest against the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement. And the last stop for approval, because this had been agreed to by virtually everyone in Europe, was just the European parliament, the one elected body within Europe. Uh, and over the months that followed, this, this takes place in early February, uh, in the months that follow, leading up to a July vote within the European Parliament, successive committees that examine the anti-counterfeiting tra trade agreement uh, consistently argue against ratification, pointing to many of the concerns. And then on July the 4th of 2012, this is literally a picture from the European Parliament with MEPs holding up signs, hello democracy, goodbye ACTA as an anti-counterfeiting trade agreement is overwhelmingly rejected by members 
uh, of the EU and the MEP in that. Uh, that treaty is effectively dead, certainly within Europe, although Canada um, is still a signatory to it and will, it remains to be seen what we do. So if you talk to, in Europe, they would certainly point to ACTA. If you talk to people in the United States, they would likely point to SOPA. I want to make the case over the, the few minutes that I have here that there is a really, I think, cool made in Canada story, though. There, we have had over the last number of years, I think, some fairly remarkable instances that I think unquestionably rival what, you, what we've seen in the United States and what we've seen uh, take place as well in Europe. So let me, I want to provide really three examples as part of this talk. First, to circle back to Bill C-30, the lawful access that uh, I didn't think I would be talking about off the top, but on Thursday uh, became again part of the discussion. The, bill, the fight against Bill C-30, though, the last iteration before just a couple of days ago, started just actually on Valentine's Day um, in 2012 with the Harper government introducing, they called it then, the Protecting Children from Internet Predators Act, despite the fact in the 90-odd page bill, the word children appears there, and I think just one other time within the bill. Um, so we're not really talking about a bill about protecting kids. Uh, Vic Taze is the minister at that point in time, and everybody knew this legislation was coming. It's legislation that involved a number of components. First off, mandatory disclosure of personal information by telecom companies and internet providers, ISPs, without court oversight. At the moment, those ISPs have the option to disclose as part of an investigation. They are also entitled to say no, come back with a warrant. This would have changed that and required them to uh, hand it over upon request. Uh, surveil a surveillance architecture within the network, although in a post-Snowden environment, it would appear we already have that. Uh, but nevertheless, surveillance capabilities within all Canadian ISPs for real-time surveillance of all internet users, and then a whole series of new warrants, warrants on transmission data, the things like the metadata and, and location data that often gets collected, and then other warrants that would require network providers to store that information and ultimately disclose that information. Now, the day before this legislation is introduced, Vic Tays is asked about it in the House of Commons. It was a, a liberal MP that raised the question, and Tays somewhat infamously says you can either stand with us or you can stand with the child pornographers. As at that point in time, the rhetoric was not about cyberbullying, but was instead about child pornography and protecting people from uh, child predators. If you go back further to prior iterations of lawful access, introduced both by conservative governments and by liberal governments, it's a nonpartisan issue in that sense. We've had the uh, rationale being terrorism, we've had the rationale being spam, and some of those other internet harms. In this particular attempt, it was all about child pornography and child predators. Uh, and so that was Taze's position. And if you think back at that point in time, the government had changed on, on all the bills that had introduced not one sentence, right? So the bills get introduced and they get passed unchanged again and again and again. But a funny thing happens on the way to yet another bill being passed unchanged. Uh, in this instance, it wasn't. And people began to speak, back, speak up and fight back using largely online tools almost immediately. This is the well-known group out of Vancouver, Open Media, that got well over 100,000 people to sign on to an online petition against the legislation. This actually comes from Anne Kavukian, who's the Ontario Privacy Commissioner. Somewhat unusual for a privacy commissioner to similarly uh, use these tools to try to advocate in this way, but that's what uh, Commissioner Kavukian did. This came from the Liberal uh, Party, which is similarly trying to, to rally people against the legislation. You, of course, had many people speaking out on this legislation. So the government's rhetoric, so to speak, on this legislation had backgrounders and FAQs about uh, child predators and why this was strictly necessary. But you had many others using independent media, using blogs, using a range of different tools to try to educate the public about all the other implications that the government wasn't spending much time talking about in terms of what this bill was all about. Somewhat infamously, you had the Vicky Leaks page um, that targeted Vic Tays. I think more interesting and frankly far more effective um, was the Tell Vic Everything campaign. So, Tell, for those that don't remember, don't know about Tell Vic Everything, this was a, a genuine grassroots bottom-up campaign um, on Twitter. And the basic idea behind it was that 
if we were going to move to a world in which there was this ubiquitous surveillance as a result of lawful access legislation, if the government was in a position to know everything, well, then you might as well just tell them everything anyway. And so people began to tweet using the hashtag tell Vic everything, the, you know, here's what I had for breakfast, Vic, um, which, I, which I recognize some people think that's what people talk about on Twitter. But uh, that's often, of course, not really the case. So people start talking about all sorts of different things, uh, always with the hashtag tell Vic everything. By far my favorite um, was this tweet here, hey at Vic Taze. <laughs> there you go. All right. There you go. For the purposes of the video, I lost, an, I lost an email from my work account yesterday. Can I get your copy? Uh, it is quite amazing to think about what you can do in 140 characters. Uh, because in this case, in 140 characters, you came up with something that's not only obviously really funny, uh, but also enormously effective in terms of the kind of messaging uh, that, want to, that, that they wanted to raise here. And this comes up, you can see it's February 16th, so it's two days after the bill is introduced. There are hundreds of these tell Vic everything tweets um, as this went viral at that point in time. That weekend, Vic Tays gives uh, an interview to Evan Solomon uh, on CBC's The House. And he's asked specifically about the tell Vic everything campaign. And he says he finds it, he says, it's really funny. Um, the problem, of course, if you're a politician, though, is that if they're laughing at you rather than not with you, you're pretty sunk. And in this instance, people were laughing at him and laughing at that legislation, not with him. Within a, two weeks, the government decided to hit the pause button, so to speak, on this legislation. And it wasn't coming back. Note, and it's a little tough to see. I, I noted it actually just as I was reviewing this for one last time. The, the banner up at the top there, protecting children from internet, and I assume it's predators at the bottom where you've got Nicholson and Vic Tays in front. And so at least the government can't be accused of recycling some things. Um, in this instance, it seems that they almost recycled the exact same message right in front of the podium as that they've just used for Peter McKay. In any event, um, here, they, here the government, here, here the Ottawa says they're going to hit the pause button. And then almost exactly a year later, so earlier this year, they announce officially that this legislation is not coming back. A recognition that they say they are killing the online surveillance bill. And in fact, Nicholson at the time says, any attempts that we will continue to have to modernize the criminal code will not contain the measures in C30. Now that commitment lasted, it turns out, less than a year. Um, because just on Thursday, the government brought back not all the measures in Bill C-30, to be fair, so some of the more controversial provisions have been excluded, but many of the provisions around the new, the new warrants, around almost creating incentives for internet providers to disclose, uh, are back. As an example, there will be, if this is passed, full immunity for internet providers, for telecom companies, to voluntarily disclose subscriber information um, without a warrant. No liability, no civil liability, no class action lawsuits if they do it, no criminal liability if they do it. And the government is actually changing the ability of law enforcement to ask for this information. At the moment, the law typically says that they have to be, uh, they can ask for voluntar voluntary participation or assistance in the enforcement of any act. The law would be changed to not even require to be as part of the enforcement of any act. It's simply they can ask um, if anybody supports without a warrant um, under, this, under the bill as currently described, full immunity, no liability under either civil or criminal liability as part of this bill. But as I say, it was just introduced and we will see what happens. But it's not just in the context of Bill C-30, which was at least a really good success story until Thursday. Um, there are other stories that I think have seen similar kinds of successes. So consider telecom policy. When the government, was, government first got started, you, could see, you may recall yet another form of rhetoric. They always called themselves Canada's new government, and then it became the Harper government. So back when the government was calling itself Canada's new government uh, in 2006, the industry minister at the time was Maxime Bernier, a um, uh, vowed anti-regulation uh, minister. And Bernier uh, moved the CRTC and telecom regulation very hard towards a market-based approach. Now, arguably, it's always been uh, had a strong market-based approach, and the CRTC intervenes at times, but not particularly aggressively. Uh, this was designed to send a very clear message that the default approach when it came to telecom-related issues would be 
no regulation. Where there is sufficient competition, and there's of course much debate about what sufficient competition might mean, but where there is sufficient competition, no need for government regulation. And so the government at that time moved strongly away from an active CRTC in terms of telecom regulation related issues. Uh, and so unsurprisingly, the major telecom companies take advantage of that. And we see that play out in any number of different ways, one of which involved usage-based billing. The idea that we would establish, or telecom companies, ISPs, would establish, in a sense, meters on people's internet use. And the more you use, the more you pay, which of course has a bit of an intuitive feel. And yet the reality is there's, there's the danger of anti-competitive uses of this. There was a complaint actually filed just this week against Bell, um, with someone noting that if you were using Bell's wireless services uh, for online video, if you use Bell's own content, the content they now own via their purchase of CTV, uh, five gigabytes worth of that video would cost you, I think it's $5 is their deal. If you happen to try to get it from a competitor, say Netflix, that same five gigabytes costs you $40. Um, and so there's real concern about that kind of misuse. Uh, Usage-based billing can be used and almost as a disincentive to use unless you create large caps in a sense for some of your own content. There was also real concern with the implementation of usage-based billing that many independent ISPs that often use part of the network from an established player like a TELUS or a Bell would find themselves un, unable to fully compete as UBB usage-based billing would be used to limit their ability to compete on price as compared to some of the uh, more established players. Now, once again, we've got a government that had established clear mandate to the CRTC. Its market forces is the preferred approach. And so unsurprisingly in that context, CRTC approves the usage-based billing. Uh, and yet once again, a funny thing happens on the way to that. Uh, in this instance, it's actually Open Media's first big campaign where they have this Mind the Cap uh, petition, a petition that generates ultimately more than half a million users, people signing on to this petition. And I was on a panel, like I say, just a couple of weeks ago, it was the uh, ISP Telecom Summit in Toronto. Maybe just, you know, I can't keep track of the dates anymore. It was within the last couple of weeks, sitting on a panel with someone who was at the time, uh, the minister, industry minister at the time, at that time was Tony Clement. Um, and it was a senior advisor to Clement, and he, told, and he told the entire conference that the reaction that they received to usage-based billing, much of it generated through this campaign, was unprecedented in the, in the government's history. They simply had never received that many responses from genuine individual IP addresses as they did on usage-based billing. Now we can debate whether or not this ought to be the campaign that trumps them all, um, caps on internet services, but nevertheless, for whatever it's worth, this was the one that did it. In fact, the protests were not just online, but there were people that took to the streets. This was in Montreal. There were some here in Toronto that rallied against it as well. And once this really began to take hold, as the thousands and hundreds of thousands of people sign on and the media begins to cover the story, uh, the industry minister, Clement, within a couple of days, begins to ultimately says to the CRTC, you're going to have to overrule this decision. And so sure enough, the CRTC decides about a month later, say, well, you know what? We'd like to take a new look at the decision that we just passed. We just handed down and they ultimately hold renew hearings and ultimately make changes to their UBB approach. Now, if this was just a story on telecom and UBB, I suppose it would be interesting enough that they were able to generate this kind of interest and have this impact. But in many ways, I'd make the argument that the real story of UBB is not what happened on UBB, but rather what happened next. Because this government went from a government that was of the view that market forces ought to prevail when it comes to telecom, to in a post-UBB environment, coming to the realization that these sorts of telecom issues, basic connectivity, which is so crucial for everyone across the country, was a key voter issue. They, uh, they see it in terms of being a pocketbook issue, one that people would be willing to vote on and one that people would clearly be willing to engage on. And so what we have seen since is a truly complete reversal of where the government was at only a few years ago when it comes to telecom policy. The CRTC now is, has, has made very clear in terms of its priorities for the next number of years, its consumers and access that sit at the very top of its priorities. And that comes from uh, the new chair, Jean-Pierre Blais. 
They've implemented that in a number of different ways, and the government's been on side with this. One is the wireless code that takes place formally, that formally takes effect in the next couple of weeks. One of the big issues people were frustrated with was the three-year contracts on wireless. Uh, there now is effectively a two-year um, two-year two-year limit on contracts as someone any contract that's longer people can get out without any penalty whatsoever under the wireless code and so all the carriers are shifting to two-year contracts virtually they're all there uh, and if they're not by December 2nd they have no choice but to be there CRTC's also announced just over the last number of weeks that they're going to scrutinize roaming rates so one of the big frustrations for consumers are the costs of roaming uh, CRTC taking a look at that roaming issue and lo and behold within weeks of the CRTC announcing an investigation into roaming Bell and Rogers and some of the other wireless providers cut some of their some of their roaming fees in half Suddenly now there was all sorts of room to cut those fees and so US roaming fees have dropped in half just over the last number of months in the immediate aftermath of, of the prospect of regulation in the area of course, perhaps most infamously, we had this past summer the battle over the potential entry of Verizon into the country uh, with the large th big three telecom companies uh, arguing for a fair playing field, uh, the government going to battle to try to keep, uh, to argue that they were going to maintain the ability for foreign entrants like Verizon to enter into the country, um, Verizon choosing ultimately not to do so. And regardless of your views on whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, What's undeniable is that the government has at a minimum tried to position itself as a pro-consumer government when it comes to those kinds of issues. When it comes to telecom, it has changed completely. And the driver behind that on telecom and then now increasingly on television as well, how many people would have thought that a throne speech would actually make a commitment to pick and pay television channels? Uh, yeah, this one has, in part because the government looks at telecom policy and increasingly broadcast policy um, as a core consumer issue. I would argue that this didn't just happen, did, did, did Stephen Harper didn't just wake up one day and decide that people needed cheaper roaming fees. What happened was UBB, when half a million Canadians began to speak up, um, and from a political perspective, there was a realization that this was an issue that people would become actively engaged on. Now, finally, there's copyright, the issue that, uh, that in, cer in certain respects has changed already. This legislation has already passed, and I want to quickly walk you through the dynamics that changed on copyright as well. My starting point would be in 2004, and I'll go quickly, I promise. We could probably go earlier on, but 2004 represents, I think, in many ways, the high water mark in terms of what I would describe as a more maximalist, more and more protection is what copyright is all about approach. It's an approach that I don't think represents the interests of users very well. Frankly, I think it's an approach that doesn't represent the interests of creators very well either. But what you do have is many of the large intermediaries, the movie industry, the record industry, um, on those distributor labels, by and large, arguing for very strong um, protections, locking down of content in some instances, uh, using digital locks and the like to lock those things down. In 2004, Bolte, who was a liberal area MP from a liberal MP from uh, from Toronto, uh, is the chair of the Standing Committee on Canadian Heritage. She's frustrated with the slow pace of copyright reform in Canada, and Bolte argues. Uh, that they need to have hearings on copyright reform, the goal being they will hold these hearings a half day per issue, so a half day on the role of internet providers, a half day on education, half day on digital locks and our adherence to international treaties. Uh, these are issues that are pretty complicated, but they try to go very quickly. And the report itself says, um, essentially, whatever the, some of the strong rights holders are looking for is what we think we ought to do. Uh, that leads to Bill C-60, the first piece of copyright reform. It's actually a liberal bill. And if we take a look at what it contained, and we'll trace the evolution of copyright over the number of years, if we take a look what it contained, there's nothing on the flexibilities that might be inherent within, fair deal, within copyright, such as fair dealing or consumer-related exceptions, certainly not internet exceptions, nothing on statutory damages that have led up until the most recent reforms, consumers or others, to face the prospect of millions in liability over some infringements. There was strong protection for digital locks, and there was protection for telecom companies or ISPs. In fact, that will never change. Uh, throughout the evolution of this legislation, their power was quite strong. 
Um, that's the first attempt at this, but that bill dies fairly quickly. Um, the next attempt at the legislation comes in 2007. By then, we've had a change in government uh, from liberal to conservative. The industry minister at that time, the portfolio changes so much, at that time is Jim Prentice. Um, and in December of 2007, Prentice is the industry minister. Uh, this is the notice paper notifying that there will be uh, a copyright bill introduced. Um, that goes up on a Friday, the expectation being that the legislation will be introduced uh, the following week. It was supposed to be on the Tuesday. And yet, quite amazingly, it wasn't. The reason for that had a lot to do with this Facebook group here, which I must admit, by today's standards in 2013, the notion that a Facebook group would have any sort of impact seems kind of quaint. Um, but nevertheless, back in 2007, I started this Facebook group about a week before that appearance on the notice paper, knowing that the legislation was coming uh, and looking to use this relatively new social media tool. It's not, it wasn't new in 2007, but it was still just at a hockey stick growth stage with many Canadians on board to use that as a tool so that people could know more about the legislation and would have the ability to speak out about it. A few people start joining, 1,000 after one day, then 2,000, 10,000 after the first week. It ultimately grows to about 90,000 people and there are local area chapters, about 20 of them across the country, some of whom have more than 1,000 or so members as well, um, out of a Facebook group. Um, that's not a lot, again, by today's standards, but at that point in time, the government had a hard time figuring out what to make of uh, some of these social media campaigns. Now, it wasn't just Facebook. I blogged about it, as did others, created YouTube videos about this sort of thing. And as it happens, Prentice was holding a holiday party that weekend. So this went on the notice paper on, uh, I think it was Thursday or Friday, but this Facebook group that whole week had begun to um, sort of take off. And with Prentice's holiday party that Saturday at his office in Calgary, um, I blogged about it, so did others, saying that if you were in the area, you might want to spread some holiday cheer. Um, <laughs> and talk about a piece of legislation that, as I say, hadn't even been introduced yet. Um, in fact, many people showed up. There was about 50, 60 people that did show up, including some that drove from Edmonton down to Calgary, uh, just for a couple of minutes with the minister to express concern, as I say, about a bill that hadn't been introduced. In the week that followed, yeah, thanks, especially if you showed up. So the bill hadn't been introduced yet. Uh, the media begins to pick up on the story. Uh, first, the trade press talking both about the activities and the engagement that people were having, then the national press, and then ultimately the decision to delay the legislation. And so the government was to have introduced it on the, the Tuesday. They choose not to. Then it was going to be introduced on the Thursday, which was the last day that the House was sitting in that session before the holiday break. And again, they blink and choose not to. I'm often, I'm often fond of this slide with two headlines from the Globe that uh, I frankly never thought we'd see. The Ottawa accused to caving into Hollywood on copyright appeared on the front page of the Globe. Um, one Saturday morning, it was actually the Canadian Library Association, uh, so shout out to the librarians, who held an event on Parliament Hill that day before. Uh, and it might have been a slow news day, admittedly, but nevertheless, uh, the notion that uh, this is the kind of coverage that we'd get on the front page of the Globe was, I think, somewhat unexpected, to say the least. Um, the other piece with the headline that I like to say I can never convince my wife or my kids of, uh, how did copyright become cool? Um, because it seemed, at least for a brief period of time, that people were actively engaged on the issue. Now, six months later, I should say, the legislation does come back. And if we take a look at it, if, and I'm honest about it, not all that much changes. So almost nothing changes. In fact, the only thing that does change is a minor tweak on statutory damages, where the government creates a cap of $500 for potential liability for teenagers and others that might download. One of the ministers is asked, well, what happens if someone uploads an infringing YouTube video? Does this apply here? Um, the answer is no, it doesn't. The full liability of up to $20,000 per infringement would still apply. And so it was kind of gimmicky, and it didn't really work. And so what happened was, once again, thousands of Canadians spoke out. Industry Canada receives more than 30,000 physical letters within three weeks of this legislation having been introduced. This is as we're heading into the summer. It's introduced in the in June. Uh, throughout the course of the summer, the groups begin to come together and to rally and speak out. And this is genuine grassroots activity. This is the local area Facebook group uh, here in Vancouver. And I always found it quite interesting. I mean, it's just people who found one another through Facebook, 
found a place in their communities where they could meet. Someone took it upon themselves to create agenda um, and to report out and begin to find ways to engage and speak out. It wasn't just on Facebook. This was the group in Montreal that created a wiki-based um, version of the same kind of thing. Uh, who are the local MPs? What are the kinds of things that you might speak out about? We used Google Maps to highlight media coverage. In this case, red was negative, yellow was neutral, and blue was positive. And so the media coverage of the bill was really negative. Used Google, Google Calendar to highlight all these local events so people could see what was taking place. There was even swag, like t-shirts and mugs which I must admit my wife would like me to get rid of at this point in time out of the closet. But nevertheless, we've got an assortment of t-shirts, things like fair copyright for, for Canada. There was a YouTube contest, C61 in 61 seconds, inviting people to create a video that was 61 seconds long, talking about the problems with the legislation. And people like Ann Kavukian and Stephen Page from the Bare Naked Ladies were some of the judges. Uh, and what we found from all of this was MPs. Conservative MP Bruce Stanton from Aurelia, Souk Dhaliwal is an MP at the time, uh, Liberal MP in uh, BC, held town hall meetings that summer on copyright. As multiple MPs told us that over the course of that summer, copyright was one of the top three issues they heard about all summer long. Now note that there is no big companies behind any of this. There is no truly organized campaign behind any of this. It is simply Canadians speaking out, using these tools as a mechanism to do so. That bill dies with yet another election campaign, and the government's first move when it comes back is not to bring the bill back, but instead to say we're going to hold a consultation on the issue. And lo and behold, thousands of people show up. Many government consultations are such that, right, frankly, relatively small numbers of people participate. In this case, they got more than 8,000 submissions, which for a government policy consultation is off the charts. And I'm not going to say the government listened to all of it, but they certainly listened to some. And so when they introduced their new legislation, uh, not again back to this issue of rhetoric and facts and fictions when it comes to uh, marketing of legislation, they registered, as you can see, the domain name or used the domain name balanced copyright gc.ca and the whole messaging behind this was that this was a balanced copyright bill. Um, government becoming more engaged. In fact, uh, Tony Clement took to Twitter to directly answer questions um, from anyone within hours of the bill having been introduced. So James Moore took a somewhat different approach. A couple of weeks later, he was speaking to um, a, gr a group representing um, some of the major IP lobby groups uh, in which he urged people to fight back against the radical extremists who said that opposed this legislation, uh, urging them to speak out, whether it was in social media, on, in the media, in the regular media and press, wherever it happened to be. Um, other groups spoke out as well. Uh, writers groups spoke out against the legislation using Facebook. They were upset with it. There was a counter to the Facebook group, that uh, the Fair Copyright for, for Canada. This is Balanced Copyright for Canada that was started by the major music labels. Um, we're trying to argue for the same sort of thing. So you had lots of groups using social media in an effort to try to engage on this. And what we ultimately end up, up with in the bill is a bill that didn't change, frankly, quite much from when it was introduced, but it changed dramatically from where we were at a few years earlier. And so if we look at some of the reforms, we see that there is now fair dealing reform as part of this bill that was ultimately passed in 2012, creating a series of new exceptions, including things for parody and satire, uh, as well as for education. There are a series of new consumer exceptions, things like time shifting, which would essentially be recording of television shows, um, making backup copies or format shifting. Incredibly, from the time when the heritage minister is asked whether or not uploading a video to YouTube might create infringement and liability, we ended up with a user-generated content exception that protects anyone that creates for non-commercial purposes new kinds of works. Um, remix, mashup, where you're bringing together some works, mashing them together to create something new, now protects those users as non, and makes that non-infringing activity, protects sites that, that host those uh, as well. There is genuine statutory damages reform, reform that for non-commercial purposes places a cap on liability at $5,000 which is not insignificant to be sure. It's certainly not reason enough to go out and fringe if you face the prospect of $5,000 in liability. 
but it also means that you don't face the prospect of potentially millions in liability, losing your home and everything else as part of um, those kinds of lawsuits. Although digital locks and the internet safe harbor provisions for ISPs remained as well. So the changes were pretty significant and the users there I think had a pretty big impact. And I think you can make the argument that some of that impact has continued to play itself out. Canada was amongst a number of, of participants in an international treaty for the visually impaired uh, that was signed in Marrakesh, Morocco, or completed in Marrakesh, Morocco in June of this year that should make it easier for the um, export and distribution of materials uh, for those that are for the blind and the sight impaired. Uh, Canada has yet to implement that, but all reports back from the last set of negotiations that I say took place in June of this year was that Canada played a pretty important role in trying to facilitate the creation of that treaty. More recently, we've got anti-counterfeiting legislation, uh, which um, some groups are arguing for a series of changes that would, I think, actually make the bill far worse. And in fairness to the government, um, they try to try to strike some amount of balance within the anti-counterfeiting bill as a sort of the best example of this would be on the issue of in-transit shipments. Uh, in-transit shipments is when there is a shipment coming from one country, it may stop briefly in Canada on its way to going somewhere else. Um, in Europe, that as a result they have for a while until it was struck down, they would seize in-transit shipments that were alleged to have infringed either say on trademark grounds, and in many instances were seizing generic pharmaceuticals. In one instance, there were some generic AIDS medicines that were headed through Europe from India on their way to Nigeria for a Clinton Foundation um, initiative. Those were seized. Other initiatives were other kinds of generic pharma headed from India to Brazil were also seized. Uh, there have been a number of groups that have argued just in the last number of weeks at, uh, at committees before the House of Commons that Canada ought to similarly seize when there are in-transit shipments, and yet this bill actually does exclude that. And finally, there is the TPP, which is enormously problematic, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. But just in the last 10 days, WikiLeaks leaked out the intellectual property chapter. And it was really a sort of a good news, bad news situation. The bad news first was that Pretty much all the worst fears that people had about what the United States was trying to uh, see included within this treaty when it comes to intellectual property, both with respect to patents and pharmaceuticals, as well as on intellectual property issues, is exactly what they're trying to do, um, but oftentimes with, with somewhat limited support. It actually went country by country. Um, but what was rather surprising, I have to say, is that Canada, at least on the intellectual property issue within the TPP, was for now standing its ground. In fact, Canada stands alone with the most number of individual proposals within the TPP IP chapter, uh, many times arguing for some of the flexibilities that they just now included in the legislation. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to stick with it. Uh, it's quite possible, as we've seen in other treaty negotiations, that the government may ultimately cave. But we have seen a shift, a shift internationally, and I would say a shift domestically. So where does all of this leave us? I admit it may be a bit of a cop-out, but it's sort of a glass half full, glass half empty kind of thing. Um, if you are a glass half full, you take a look at these initiatives and say, you know what, there is the prospect for having an impact. We have seen it happen. And regardless of the political party or the government in power, and whether we're talking about federal or provincial, it's clear that there is, I think, growing awareness uh, of users' interest in digital rights issues as they relate to things like privacy or freedom of expression and the like, uh, and increasingly a willingness to at a minimum pay attention if not uh, implement those sorts of rules. If your glass half empty though, it's clear that this is a fight that seemingly never ends. Um, as we saw with respect to lawful access on the weekend, as we see with respect to efforts to within the TPP or within other sorts of treaties, uh, as it just seemingly continues and continues and continues. And so I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting area, it's an exciting area, but at the end of the day, for anyone who is interested in these issues, I think it's clear that many of us will have to keep fighting. Thanks very much for your attention. Well, I think one of the things that we've seen over the last few days in talking about information uh, and uh, knowledge is the importance of not only getting the information right, but the importance of really getting it out there. And one of the things that comes out of this presentation is the, the knowledge 
as I think we all had some inclination to believe, that all the new media are really fundamental to doing that. Uh, now, I think without any more ado, what I'd like to do is to go to some questions. I'm sure we have a lot of them. And what we'll try to do here is to aim for degree of gender balance, age, etc. And uh, we're going to take three questions at a time. And please try to keep to asking a, uh, a question uh, very concisely. And uh, then we'll go from there. So yes, just up here. Do we have a, a second one afterwards? Sure. Go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, uh, Congratulations, it was a great uh, presentation. Um, you, it's quite obvious that we do have a capacity to uh, um, build major campaigns on the internet. Um, but I think we're missing a vast amount of potentiality. Um, right now, there's about 54% of poor people that don't have regular access to the internet. And the only group that I know of in Canada that is actually doing anything about it is ACORN Canada. So I do encourage anybody in the audience and the Parklands Institute to actually work with uh, ACORN. But I was wondering, what else could we do as citizens to make sure that we uh, um, help eradicate poverty by actually giving the poor access to the internet? And I'll take a couple of other questions here, uh, just at the back here. Yeah. Hi. Um, despite my uh, young age, I'm not all that uh, computer tech savvy. I've got an old, old computer that can barely make the internet work kind of thing. Um, and I hear all of these um, you know, I'm concerned about things getting on my computer that I don't know about. I don't know what to be afraid of and what I can be comfortable with and what sites I can go on and I can't go on. And I'm just wondering, you know, how does, how does uh, those of us who um, haven't been at the university or been in a, a computer class in the last 10 years or 15 years um, know how to navigate this stuff? It's okay that you're uh, somewhat of a novice in this. This is my uh, flip phone. My kids laugh at me. That, uh, and I only got this a few months ago. So, um, Do we have a, a third question here? And then we'll... Uh, I want to try to get somebody else who maybe hasn't had a chance to ask a question during the, uh, the conference. Anybody else out there? Hi. Right there. Uh, my name is Lane. Um, so my question is just to try and educate people a little bit about what Bell is doing with their media lately. They're recording everything. I'm a Bell customer, and there's no way for anyone to do anything about this with this corporation. And is this legal? Um, does it take a class action? Like, what are remedies available? Yeah. Michael? OK, so those are three great questions. I actually think the first two are related. Uh, because the issues around digital literacy and experience and digital access, um, I think, are in many ways connected. Uh, and I totally agree. I did a column just a couple of weeks ago that looked at the Statistics Canada data uh, that highlighted a genuine digital divide within our country, where if you take a look at um, users in the top half, half of household income, uh, internet use in the household is well over 90%. In fact, it's close, closer to 100%. Uh, if you take a look in the bottom quartile of income, it drops to around 60%, so it's about a 30-35% gap. Um, and that's, that holds true, I think, quite notably, uh, regardless of age. Um, and so there is sometimes this tendency to think that, well, uh, younger kids are online regardless of income. It's not true. Uh, in fact, where you look at the wireless issue and affordability on wireless, you see the same gap, if not more, um, amongst sort of 18 to 24s when it comes to wire, uh, using the internet for wireless, let's flip phone issues aside. Um, and so you find there are, there, are, there are many people that simply can't afford it, and then many times won't, don't have the skills or um, the tools otherwise to know quite what to do. And the government has not been good on this canceling the community access program, which played a pretty key role. Uh, as for what can be done, um, I'm hopeful that a number of things can. I think this is a thing to advocate on. Um, because I think, there, I think there's simply no question that 
Um, it's in everyone's interest, and this is true, again, across the political spectrum, to ensure that everyone has access. I mean, even if you're thinking about moving towards uh, electronic-based delivery of some government services, you can only do that if you know that people have access. If they don't, um, you can't. It creates a lot of duplication. So I think there's a lot of potential there. Uh, there are some initiatives, though. In fact, one, besides what, what you just referenced, I sit on the board of CIRA, the Canadian Internet Registration Authority, and this will answer the lady's question as well. And CIRA, I, I joined the board in part because a country code top level domain like .ca generates a lot of revenue, quite frankly. It's just recurring revenue for people that register their domain names year after year after year. Uh, there are other country code domains in other countries that have used some of that revenue to give back into public interest programs. Uh, I joined in part because I thought Canada ought to be doing the same or got myself elected to the board for those reasons. And we announced publicly um, just a few weeks ago, and then there will be a full rollout early next year uh, on what will be a million dollar um, program per year funding internet-based initiatives, which includes stuff on security and stuff on internet governance, and actually quite importantly, stuff on literacy um, as well as access. So, uh, hey, thanks. So I think, thanks. I think it's a cool program. Um, and if you're with an organization that is involved in some of these things, please keep an eye out for it or contact me because we're looking for really great projects to fund. Uh, so hopefully there are some other ways to get this done. Um, the question about Bell is a great one. Uh, and for those that hadn't been following it, Bell announced to their wireless subscribers just over the last couple of months that they already actually do collect pretty much everything about you. Uh, but they now plan to use that information in different ways. And so their notification advised that they would be using everything from the websites you visit to the search terms you enter to the kinds of devices you use to uh, how frequent you are with your bill payments and your location. I mean, they have all of that data. And they would be using, using it for targeted advertising purposes. Um, they're forcing people to opt out of that. They have over 8 million customers. And they say they think it's reasonable to force every single one of those 8 million people, if they don't want that use, to individually opt out each time. Um, I've tried to make the argument, actually, it's a pieces I've written, that I don't think that's a fair reading of the law. Um, I think given the sensitivities associated with the information, they should be required to, force, to, to have an opt-in approach where people can choose to uh, have this information used in this way, um, but they can't use it essentially as a default. The Privacy Commissioner of Canada is investigating, so she announced that her office would be investigating. But this effectively took, a, it took effect, I think just last week was uh, when it was formally taking effect. So if you are a Bell subscriber and this isn't something you want then, and you haven't opted out, uh, you might want to do so. Um, the Commissioner's investigation will no doubt take longer though. Uh, my understanding is there may also be a complaint to the CRTC, uh, which has jurisdiction over privacy related issues with respect to telecom. Uh, and so there are questions as to whether or not this violates um, some of the CRTC rules, too. We certainly have time for a few more questions here. So uh, again, uh, Kevin over here and then just back over here. Hello. I can hear you. Well, anyway, you hear me. Um, the, uh, oh, were you aware that the, uh, after a 70 year gap in any legislation with the Liberal Party in 1979, um, had a couple of people, Keyes and Burnett, write a white paper that was, had yellow covers, delivered to the uh, Canadian Library Association Conference in Ottawa in 1979, and that started a lot of discussion in the library and education community. I was. Because I'm sure why don't we take a couple more and I'll, and I'll talk about the Keys and Brunet study. Hello. Um, thank you so much for your presentation and I hope this isn't a giant derail. Uh, that being said, um, I do have some questions around, uh, so there's communities online that experience harassment and bullying and stalking and notably feminist communities, anarchist communities, queer folks. And so I've seen in my Facebook when these bills do get introduced, people are like, yay, they're going to finally address this, which is kind of what some other sessions were talking about, about the grafting on yeah. of the language that things that people could agree with, but it's not actually going to do anything for them. 
Um, are there, you know, uh, internet, uh, net neutrality uh, folks in the campaign who are advocating for legislation to try to curtail that? And how do we balance between, you know, the the issues that you raise in your in your presentation with the very clear need to have some kind of legislation around this? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. That was fascinating presentation. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. Uh, I've got lots of questions, but I'm going to try to just pick one here. Um, it, it's not easy, to, as an understatement, to win a major policy uh, against a majority government. So it's, and we've also been hearing a lot this weekend about the, uh, the breakdown of the state and its ability to sort of provide in the interests of its citizens. So it, I think it begs the question, who are these people that have been so resistant on these policies? Um, would you say it's a social movement? Um, do you know about their political orientation? Is it sort of a libertarian thing or is it more progressive? Um, the sophistication of the organization, it, would love to hear your thoughts on okay. that sort of stuff. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Um, so with respect to Keys and Brunet, you're right. There have been, there were, in, in a, you know, I, I started in 2004. I could have gone back to 2001, which is when the government held one study on digital copyright. I could have gone back to the 1990s when they passed the Wiper Internet Treaties. I could have gone back to a series of reports that were commissioned by Industry Canada in the 80s or to Keys and Brunet from the 70s. So you're right, there's, there is, there is a, a whole history for sure behind all of this. What makes, I think, the most recent experience around copyright somewhat unique is that it, that uh, it was, I, in my view anyway, um, the individual grassroots effort largely owns, to your question, unorganized, at least or unorganized in the sense that you did not have, uh, that some of the most effective stuff was academics or individuals who took it upon themselves to speak out. And um, the library and education community, of course, played a, a, an important role. They have for a very long time. Um, but what made this different was, I'm sometimes fond of saying that it, it used to be that you could when you talked about copyright stakeholders on these issues, you could easily fit everybody, certainly into this room, frankly, in a room far smaller, uh, because it was a fairly small number of people that were actively engaged. That changed um, in the last 10 years, and I think that's a pretty exciting thing. But it is, and so to your point, in many instances, pretty unorganized. Um, you know, for example, I, I threw up that slide of people showing up at Jim Prentice's place uh, or his constituency office. I mean, the, the background on that is um, I blogged it. Cory Doctorow, who's a well-known uh, sci-fi writer and one of the bloggers at Boing Boing, uh, blogged about it uh, to try to raise some awareness. And that resulted in a fellow by the name of Kempton Lamb, who just happened to be an interested person in this stuff, sending me an email saying, is there anything I can do? Um, and so he showed up and tried to build something around this. And so it was truly unorganized in that sense. That has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, it means there are oftentimes people who say things that um, even I sometimes cringe about, uh, even though I know they're trying to be supportive. Um, at the same time, it means that it's, it's far more genuine than the um, kind of rhetorical speaking points that you often find from more established groups that have a lot of much harder time adapting. We saw that, I think, very clearly actually in the United States with SOPA, where the, the major lobby groups were so committed to their particular approach, their speaking points, that when things started changing, with, both with Wikipedia and otherwise, they had just no real capability of adapting quickly. And so that kind of loosely connected approach can actually be quite effective. Now, to your question, and it was an excellent one, you know, in a sense, what about the real harms that exist, and um, is there a willingness to tackle those? Uh, I think unquestionably there is. I don't think that those that focus on issues around net neutrality um, are, folk, are, are somehow against any of that. They're not at all. Um, what they are against are intermediaries using the power that they have to leverage that power in a way um, that may silence certain voices or result in any competitive behavior. With respect to dealing with the, the genuine harms, and they are genuine, uh, I think we have seen some legislative initi initiatives, sometimes in reaction to some of the very worst cases that arise, and, and that may be true, again, with C-13. 
The challenges, I, to be honest, in some of those instances, though, go beyond the jurisdiction. And so the protections that some of the large internet players enjoy, the Googles and Facebooks of the world, which has a tremendous pro-free speech um, component to it, a component that basically says they're not liability, not liable rather, for uh, the things that their users say, um, which means that they are very reluctant to take anything down, which when it's different voices that aren't otherwise heard and might try to be, and there might be efforts to try to silence, is tremendously effective, something that actually Canadian sites don't have in terms of that same kind of protection. But at the same time, it means that real harms can occur and there is a reluctance to deal with it. In fact, the, the leading case on this legislation in the United States, one of the very first cases, was a case involving a fellow by the name of Ken Zirin, who was just a guy, um, happened to living in Seattle, and for whatever reason, someone targeted him by saying that he was in favor of the Oklahoma City bombing, which you may recall from some time uh, ago. And so he started getting all sorts of um, hate mail and other kinds of things, and then a radio station looked him up, found, out, found his phone number online, started broadcasting his phone number, so he was getting literally every second all these hate calls and things like that. He ultimately sued AOL, which was the host of this, for having failed to remove that information once they were notified, uh, and AOL won, um, because there is these, these very strong protections for intermediaries. Um, so the U.S. approach is one that errs very heavily on the side of freedom of speech, but I think you're really right to point out there are consequences for that, and sometimes they aren't all positive. Well, I think we'll uh, end it there. I know there's still a few questions here, but uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking Michael for just fabulous uh, talk here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michael, we have a little gift. Uh, thank you for coming out here. If you don't know, Michael arrived just earlier today, so uh, from Ottawa. So uh, it's it's a long trek to do this. So thank you so much. Okay, Finally, in in conclusion, I want to thank all of you for uh, coming to this conference. I think it's been quite fabulous. You can put it on your calendar. Next year, around the same time, we're going to be holding another conference, so please show up for that as well. And continue to provide us the support, the ideas, the energy that you do year in, year out. Thank you again. We'll see you again in future. Thanks.